in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, draw near to us your servants and answer our prayers with your unceasing kindness. May we glory in you as our creator and guide. Kindly restore what you have created in us and keep safe what you have restored. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our catechesis today, I wish that we look at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men in the wilderness by our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. This miracle story is unique in the sense that it is reported by all the four evangelists. Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 17. And John chapter 6, verses 1. 14. This miracle demonstrates on one hand the identity of Jesus as a Messiah, and on the other hand, it defines his character as a compassionate king, an attribute that distinguishes his kingdom. The Gospel of Matthew, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 men, comes immediately after the kingdom parables of chapter 13. Apropos, chapter 13 concluded the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth by both the religious leaders and the social elites. As a result, Jesus was unable to do many mighty works among them because of their unbelief. The unpleasant experience of Jesus at Nazareth is coupled with the sad news of the beheading of John the Baptist by Herod. Many of John's followers have now come to join Jesus. Trust as well as reliance on him by the masses was also increasingly growing. Yet, Herod is paranoid and believes that Jesus is seeking vengeance on him for the murder of John the Baptist. Jesus, however, withdraws to a desolate place, probably to grieve and to heal from the loss of his cousin, as well as to prepare himself adequately for the mission that lay ahead of him. At the same time, the 12 disciples had just returned from their missionary journey, and it was only fitting to give them an interval of repose and rest from their mission. Over and above, the Passover feast was drawing near, and all roads of Galilee were leading to Jerusalem, with pilgrims hastening to go and keep the feast. Luke tells us that Jesus withdrew to Bethsaida on the northeast shore of Lake Galilee, a place controlled by Philip and not Herod. Jesus and his disciples went by boat, but the crowds having walked out where Jesus was going, traveled around the lake, and on foot got there earlier. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Despite his own situation of grief and that personal need for a rest and healing, 
as soon as he disembarked from the boat, out of compassion, he started attending to the crowds. He spoke to them about the kingdom and healed those who needed to be cured. After a day of healing the sick, the disciples came to Jesus and pointed out that the people needed to be sent away so that they could go and get something to eat. However, Jesus suggested that the disciples should feed them. What the disciples were unable to do, Jesus does it with five loaves and two fish. With the five loaves of bread and two fish, he was able to feed the 5,000 men. This overwhelming miracle illustrates the authority of Jesus over nature and his divine intervention on behalf of others. And it shows that his concern for the physical and spiritual needs of the people that followed him then and those that follow him now. Like most of Jesus' miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 points beyond what meets the eye. On the one hand, the miracle is a preemptive messianic feast proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom. And on the other hand, it is a replay of God's providence, his compassion to the people of Israel in the wilderness. As God, through Moses, fed the people of Israel with manna in the wilderness, so Jesus, the new Moses, feeds the mighty crowd of 5,000 men in a desolate place. Thus, in the desolate areas of our own hearts, our own hearts of disappointment and regret about our own past, in the desolate areas of our own hearts, in our own hearts of depressing fear and anxiety about our own future, and indeed, in the desolate areas of our own hearts, of disorientation and apprehension about our present situation, Jesus is compassionate with us. He reminds us that God feels with us. He emphasizes and he empathizes with us. And he alone can heal and save us all. From our own disappointments and regrets, from all our fears and anxieties, and from all disorientation and apprehension. With the little that we have, our little energy, our insufficient resources, Jesus will make it suffice. And in abundance of our, for our, and in abundance for our needs. With his ways of grace, about the kingdom, we are nourished with hope, not only for a better tomorrow, but also he gives us a sense of direction and meaning for our life. Christ feeds us with his body, the bread of life for a pilgrim journey. The story of withdrawing into a desolate place evokes images of the wilderness, wanderings of God feeding his people in the desert. Exodus chapter 16. And the feeding miracle of Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 to 44. In a sense, the miracle proclaims Jesus as the new Moses and therefore authenticates his messianic credentials and his inauguration of the messianic banquet of the kingdom. Thus, in the wilderness of our life, Christ comes to restore and heal each and every one of us. 
He feeds us with his fullness, both in word and the broken bread shared with us in his body, the Eucharist. Therefore, this wilderness miracle serves to proclaim the gospel to the multitudes. It serves as a sign that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, a compassionate kingdom, the reign of truth, Love, compassion, justice, solidarity, trust, respect, and indeed the holistic growth and development of humankind and the environment. God is calling upon us from all walks of life to a desolate place of our own hearts to rest as well as to be restored to be reconciled and enriched with his word. He will feed us on our pilgrim journey, quenching our spiritual thirst and feeding our physical hunger and securing our eternal life. The withdrawal of Jesus into a desolate place holds special significance for Jesus and it prefigures salvation history. It is in the days that Moses met with God and prepared his ministry of liberating the people of Israel from Egypt into the promised land. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. It is in the days that Elijah fasted and prepared himself for the great task of a prophet ahead of him. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2 to 6. It is in the days that John the Baptist grew and matured into an uncompromising advocate of the truth. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. And Jesus retreats into the desert, not only to grieve and be healed, but also to prepare himself adequately for his mission. The desert is a place of austerity, a place of withdrawal. It is a school of detachment. It is a school of discipline and a school of self-control. The desert is a place of utter vulnerability and surrender. It is an environment that helps us to acquire the right disposition and the attitude to respond to God's will. It is in the desert that we find an oasis, the bounty of God and of our own inner spiritual riches that would prepare us in pursuit of the love and charity of God, not only for ourselves, but also for others. It is in our oasis of reconciliation and healing. One sin has been overcome and man's harmony with God is restored. That creation too is reconciled. Creation torn apart by strife once more become the dwelling place of peace once the kingdom is established and it begins to reign in our own hearts. As Paul attests that creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the Son of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. Restoration and renewal are preceded by an interior recollection. And this recollection is inevitably an inner struggle for fidelity. Fidelity to the task, a struggle against all the distortions of the task that claim to be its true fulfillment. It is a descent into the perils besetting mankind. For there is no other way to lift up fallen humanity. Jesus has to enter into the drama of human existence. For that belongs to the core 
of his mission. He has to penetrate it completely down to its outermost depths in order to find the lost sheep, to bear it on his shoulders and to bring it home. Thus, the most important journey of our life is a journey inward to the depths of our own being. It is a journey we are all invited to make. And Jesus sets an example as he goes into a desolate environment. This journey, my dear and sisters in Christ, takes us beyond words and images into silence. The silence which allows the restless mind to become still and in its stillness to enter into a new world of the heart. Here we find our true selves, without shades or colors of pretense. And slowly, we come to realize that what we need is God more than anything else. Because he is the source of life and love itself. The gift of realization helps us to change our life and to live for God as well as for neighbor. And our goal becomes our mission to take God's love to others every moment of our lives and with passion for that matter. From the days that Jesus will come out more fortified and widens up his message of the kingdom, to include the Gentiles more and more. First, he does this by way of mighty deeds. In the Jewish land, they after in Gentile territories, and in so doing, Jesus presents himself as Lord for all people. Matthew chapter 14 is set against the backdrop of the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. The people of Israel were expecting a messianic reign of power and prestige, a political reign that would unsettle and overthrow the Roman occupation and bring about political independence to the people of Israel. On the contrary, Jesus is offering a kingdom of compassion, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of solidarity, a kingdom of justice and truth, a kingdom of respect and trust, a kingdom that grows holistically for all people. This brought about disappointment among the Jews, and they could not accept and believe in him. Coupled with that is the sad news of the beheading of John the Baptist. John was his forerunner, a kinsman and a friend. The news of John's beheading should have had a toll on him. Surely he needed to break he needed a break to mourn his cousin, to heal from his disappointments, and to prepare for his forthcoming mission still ahead. According to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 14 to 29, John the Baptist was beheaded by the order of Herod. This dramatic event became inevitable after a cunning interplay between Herodias and her daughter, who remains nameless in the New Testament. However, according to Flavius Josephus, she was called Salome, and under that name, she went down in history. Unlike the faithful women elsewhere in Mark's Gospel, Herodias and her daughter, are not exactly models of virtue. During Herod's birthday, Salome danced before the audience 
and hard dance pleased Herod and the guests. As a reward, Herod promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And after seeking counsel of her mother, Salome asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter to be brought. Herodias, also incensed by John's condemnation of our marriage to Herod as being unlawful. Herodias was the wife of Herod's half-brother, Philip. Because of the condemnation, Herodias was so furious that she convinced Herod to arrest John and put him in prison. Herod was only too willing to do that but was very suspicious of the large crowds John attracted, so he could not do any harm to him. He let him languish in prison. Yet, the king was now being forced to have John killed. In order to save his face, and for the sake of the oath he made, he commanded John's head to be brought to Salome. And John was beheaded, and his head was brought on a platter and given to Salome, who later brought it to her mother. Thus, when Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. He went to the other side of the Jordan, most probably, This was to avoid Herod, though not out of fear of death, but because his time had not yet come. My brothers and sisters, this gave Jesus an opportunity to reconnect himself and to prepare himself adequately for his mission ahead of him. This teaches us that it is lawful to shun danger when there is an opportunity. However, without betraying the truth or sacrificing a good conscience at the altar of expedience. When Jesus disembarked, he saw a great multitude. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. Compassion is one of the characteristic attributes of God. But it is also a quality that we have been given in our nature. And so we must act upon it. Compassion is that internal yearning of sympathy and concern for others, especially those in great need. It is a deep emotion which is inherent in us that it cannot be easily shut down. Thus, we cannot easily walk away from people in great pain, from people in poverty, from people in misery, from people who are in desperate need. Jesus had compassion on the people because their desperate situation which demanded his attention, their poor health. And so he began to heal them. His compassion also extended to feeding them. It was compassion that moved Jesus to act on behalf of the people. He did not stop at asking which were righteous and which were not, who was a Jew and who was a Gentile. Jesus had compassion on them all and without making inquiries or setting conditions or boundaries. He saw their need and helped them. He saw their sickness and healed them. He saw their hunger and fed them. The healing ministry of Jesus was a sign to all that he was the Messiah. 
And yet, this was not the full messianic work, only a sign that Jesus was Messiah, a reminder of his identity and his character. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, there is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they say to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass. Matthew chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. Just as Jesus felt compassion for the crowds in verse 4, the disciples also feel compassion in verse 5. They are surely hungry themselves. And can you imagine the misery that awaits the crowd unless someone takes action? However, their approach to Jesus is unusual. They do not address Jesus as Lord, but explain the obvious. This place is deserted. The hour is already late. Verse 15. And immediately they issue an order, send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. The disciples assume that Jesus is so caught up in ministry that he has failed to notice the fading sunlight. They feel a responsibility to bring him back to reality, to prompt him to act sensibly. The disciples are concerned not only for the crowds, but also for Jesus. Surely, a crowd can quickly become a mob if not managed properly. Even if things don't get that far, the goodwill that Jesus had generated may dissipate if the crowd went away hungry. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat, Christ says. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ takes our contribution, however modesty it may be, and makes it enough. Christ takes that which we have to give, however modest, and it makes, and it makes it sufficient. When a widow pleaded with Elisha for help, Elisha asked, what do you have in the house? She replied, she had nothing except a pot of oil. Elisha told her to borrow pots from the neighbors and to pour oil from her pot into the other pots. When she obeyed, her little bit of oil became sufficient to fill all the pots. Elisha then said, go. Sell the oil, pay your debt, you and your son live on the rest. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verse 7. In conferring blessings, God often uses what we have at the hand. You give them something to eat. We live in a world full of poverty, full of hunger, and we pray that Jesus might do something. His response to each and every one of us is that you give them something to eat. With the possibilities at our hands, we can make a difference. 
the disciples were right to see the need in the people for food. But they would have to be the ones who should feed the people. The whole ministry is centered on feeding people. Both with the physical food, which is a part of the pastoral ministry of compassion and care. And also the speech of food, the word of God. The disciples respond, we only have five loaves and two fish. The disciples emphasize not what they have, but what they do not have. They do not see the possibilities. They do not see the opportunities, but they see problems and challenges. The assessment might be right. The disciples have five loaves and two fish, seven items enough for a small family. But the crowd is overwhelming. And their plea was act now before this situation turns ugly. End the day on a positive note. End it now. Just as the earlier generation doubted God saying, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Psalms chapter 78 verse 19. Now Jesus' disciples doubt his ability to feed the hungry crowd. We are always tempted to believe, as the disciples did, that we have nothing to offer in the face of an overwhelming need. Millions of people are hungry. We have nothing to offer except a small box of canned goods. Millions of people are infected with COVID-19 virus. There seem to be no vaccine in sight yet. The world economy has tumbled. The supply chain is in crisis. Hunger and poverty especially for poor economies, is on the rise. The pharmaceutical industry is up in arms to cash in and not necessary to save lives. And here we have nothing to offer but prayers. In such situations, we are prone to despair. He said, bring the them here to me. He commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed, broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. They all ate and were filled. They took up twelve baskets full of, of that which remained left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Matthew 14, verses 18 to 21. The miracle of the multiplication is reminiscent of Elisha's feeding miracle in 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 42. To 44. In that story, Elisha had only 20 barley loaves to feed a hundred people. When he ordered his servant to distribute the bread, the servant protested, What should I set this before a hundred men? Elisha reaffirmed the order, promising they will eat and will have some left over. The servant distributed the bread. The people ate, and there was bread left over in accordance with the promise. The linkage between the stories is made even tighter by the reference to barley loaves in John chapter 6, verse 9. It is worth noting that both Elisha and Jesus 
involved others to implement their miracles. These feedings are also reminiscent of the manna in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 16, Numbers chapter 11. Like Moses, Jesus has crossed over the water to the wilderness. Like Moses, he is surrounded by hungry people. In John's gospel, Jesus makes this connection even more explicit by referring to manna in his bread. From heaven discourse, following the feeding of the 5,000. John chapter 6, verse 31 and verse 49. The feeding of the 5,000 is a compassion story. Jesus saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. And he healed those who are sick. It is an abundant story in which God's providence solves a problem that seemed impossible. Bring them here to me. In the disciples' hands, five loaves and two fish were not enough. But in Jesus' hands, these are more than enough. If Jesus can touch a leper and make him whole, it follows without saying that he can make an abundance out of this meager food supply. And he took five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed, broke, and gave the loaf to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. Jesus takes action. Once the disciples bring him the five loaves and two fish. He does more than just sharing in the cross pain. He feeds them. First and foremost, he orders them to sit on the grass. And he looks to heaven and blesses and breaks the laws. Thereafter, he gives the bread to the disciples to distribute. When Jesus gives thanks for the bread and, and breaks it for distribution, he's doing what a Jewish man would typically do for the family at the beginning of a meal. The disciples distribute the bread and they all ate and were filled. They took up 12 baskets full of that which remained left over from the broken pieces. 12 is an important biblical number. There were 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles. The number 12 seems to indicate a kind of spiritual completeness in the manner miracle People were permitted, were not permitted to keep leftovers, but Jesus, greater than Moses, has the disciples gather to have baskets of food after they have eaten their field. The abundance of the leftovers, especially, as contrasted with a small quantity of food with which Jesus started with, emphasizes the grand scope of the miracle. It is a godly blessing rather than a natural process. It is divine rather than a human enterprise. This miracle makes aware that Jesus was far more than a prophet. His miraculous works authenticates his claims as the son of God the King of the Jews, the Lord of all creation. With the foregoing miracle, the proper response would have been for the people of Israel to follow him and learn from him. Unfortunately, John states that they started to leave. Jesus did not satisfy 
They are messianic image of a political king which they were looking for. A conqueror of the Romans. Salient points for further reflection. At the beginning of our text, Jesus withdraws into a desert area to be alone. Oftentimes, a time away in seclusion brings us an opportunity to be focused, to be focused on priorities that may have been misplaced, issues that need to be addressed, and areas that need to be strengthened. A desolate place is ideal for inner introspection so that we don't lose the opportunity to reflect and grow in areas of need. Before Jesus was able to recollect himself, he is confronted with a desperate situation of the masses, the poor health of the people, and those thirsting for the kingdom. Jesus was compassionate. He represented the compassion of God, God the Father, especially his compassion towards the vulnerable of our own society. With his message, he healed them. With his prayer to heaven, he fed them. Jesus' powerful presence was life transforming, healing, and satisfying. We too are transformed. We too are healed. We too are satisfied by the presence and message of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to continue his work, breaking protocol to reach the unclean and disrepute, bring them with healing, reconciliation, and restoration with God. Hunger in the world is real and painful, but there are also other cravings like hunger for peace and justice, hunger for security and harmony. And perhaps the deepest desire of all is long for happiness and the meaning of life. Jesus says the apostles a seemingly impossible challenge when they point out the lack of food. He tells them, feed the people yourselves. This is, of course, cannot be done without him. He taught them a basic lesson. Whatever you have is enough. Just let me have it and I will do the rest. At Cana, they had, all that they had was water. And it was all he needed. And he did the rest. They had enough wine. In another version of this story, where one of the apostles says we only have a few loaves and some fish, but what is that among so many? He did the rest, and they had enough to eat. Before he called Lazarus forth from the tomb, he raised his eyes to heaven and said, I thank you, Father that you have heard me. There is power in the action of Jesus as he says a prayer and begins distributing the bread. It was his constant contact with the Father that inspired his action. At his baptism in the Jordan, he heard the Father's voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm all pleased. Jesus lived constantly with the Father's approval, even when everyone else rejected him. What a lesson this is for each and every one of us. In commissioning his apostles later on, he would tell them to feed the hungry, because that's what he came to do and to teach. That is why he fed the hungry before sending his disciples to do the same. It is a scandal that so large a part of today's world is made up of the hungry people. 
most of us have more than we need. We may not have as much as we want, but we have more than we need. Remember, whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. Christianity is a call to action. It is a call to do as Jesus would have done. We cannot read today's gospel and remain indifferent. The opposite to love is not hatred, but it is indifference. If God is love and we remain indifferent, then we must surely examine the presence of God in our lives. This is a fundamental and basic question that we need to ask ourselves. And we must answer it in a personal way. It is in giving that we receive. When we give, we discover that we are not at a loss. In fact, we are at a gain. It is an extraordinary paradox, but it is true. We will never know it until we try it. Christ has given us an example. We may admire his compassion, but we must go beyond admiration and become willing to imitate and follow his example. Christianity is about witnessing. And in the witnessing is the invitation to go and do likewise. If we see the poor, the hungry, the old, the sick, the homeless, and the needy, and we are moved with compassion, then it follows that we must do something for them. We may not have much, but we may have more than we need. We may reason that they will only squander what we give them, or that we should not give them because it will only encourage them to remain poor and dependent. But that is not what the scriptures tell us to be concerned about. In addition to the provision of food, there should be a spiritual message as well at all times. Man does not live on bread alone. God provides us with, with the supplies in order that we may listen to him. Any time that God provides something, it is a time, a call to faith. May every gift that we receive be an opportunity of faith. May every opportunity we have be an occasion of understanding and realization. May every moment of our life be a time of a merciful reset to become better and holier than before. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.